The pandemic has exposed inequalities of all sorts. We've seen inequalities uh, depending on your, uh, what country of origin you're in, um, your, your race, your class, your, certainly your income, the status of your work, as well as gender. And one thing that's been very surprising about this pandemic is the relative success of certain countries above others. The U.S., in comparative perspective, has performed terribly. The ability and the willingness to address the pandemic is a policy choice, right? And, and what's surprising about the U.S. in this, this context is we have far fewer constraints from the perspective of income and expertise and other sorts of things. So we should be able to have, uh, from an income perspective and from an expertise perspective, the best, if not you know, close to the best response of all. And the fact that we haven't used those le levers actually speaks to some of my research on state capacity. Right, so the U.S. is thought to have very high state capacity in terms of what they can do uh, to, to address you know, military conflict, to address uh, public health crisis. And, it, and I, I would maintain that we still have all of those resources to address these things. We still have high state capacity. We have chosen either from a, as a society, right, that we, we don't want to take it um, as seriously, but I think more likely it's a result of political institutions and politicians that, that are, are not following what is the, the polls say is actually the will of the people to uh, really address the, the, the crisis. There are policy options to, to make this much better. Right? So if you look at the, the disparity in outcomes in Europe, if you look at the disparity in outcomes in South Korea, in Taiwan, they are not having disproportionate uh, effects on their poor. And the reason is that they have robust social, social services and social benefits that mean that they don't have the layer of poor that we have here. They also have what we call automatic stabilizers. Unlike what we have in the US where now they have, Congress has to act each time. Congress has to say, okay, we're gonna send this unemployment insurance. We're gonna send more unemployment, right? And, and it's subject to this partisan conflict and brinksmanship at each stage. In Europe, when, when they have this surge in, in unemployment, it's met with a, an automatic policy that addresses unemployment of this type. Right? And, and I wanna to reiterate too is that we, it's not that we don't have the resources to do this because Europe does this with, with less resources, right? South Korea has, has done this for a long time without, with, with fewer resources. What we know from comparative politics is that our politics is, is, uh, is, is very difficult to change the status quo, right? And so the, this was actually by the founder's design, right? So this is what you, you would hear from James Madison, for example. Right? And what it has meant is that our political institutions stand in the way of, of making these sort of big policy choices. What, what we know from polling is that Americans are not any more antithetical to universal health care or income subsidies. We, Americans don't like poverty. Americans want to do something to address it. Americans don't want you know, the, the people to, to suffer in terms of their health or in terms of their wages. But, but what's, what seems to be standing in the way of, of, peop of people's preferences, which we know from polling, and the actual outcome is our institutions that make it very difficult to pass policies, especially large, you know, really transformative policies. Right? And so the, the governments who are, are, are really serious about addressing poverty and inequality um, in, in their policy realms actually reduce the, the, the shock of these, sort of, poli of these sort of events upon their poor by making people less poor. Everyone I know now is an armchair epidemiologist, right, or is, is looking at charts, right, and charts and data all day long, right, and, and they're really saying, oh, it's trending up or it's trending down. How do, we, how do we interpret this piece of data versus that piece of data? This is something that CGU can really do a lot with. And we do so in particular with strong empirical skills related to statistics, to data visualization. And CGU specializes, especially the Department of Politics and Economics, specializes in this sort of data-driven, you know, evidence-based decision-making, right? So it, it, it's not enough for me as an academic to, be, to, to use my jargon to you know, um, to talk to my discipline, right? So my discipline is a, is a small group of, of like-minded people for the most part. Right? We have our own disagreements, but from the outside, we sure look, sure look like a group of like-minded people, right? But what I can train my students in is, I want you to visualize these data so that people can, get, can get a story out of this. The only way that research can matter is if it's interpreted, is, it comes into the public sphere, 
right? And politicians are the public too, right? So most politicians are not trained or are not nearly as well trained as we are on, on matters of statistics and understanding these things, right? And so to the extent that we can take the information and use the data, understand it, and then communicate it to them in a really straightforward fashion of here's the best practice, right? Stay outside, wear a mask. Right, you know, the keep people from being from congregating for a long time. If we can do that, we can show them data and say, like, this is why. Right, this is the sort of thing that CGU is really good at uh, in order to, you know, pushing the, the research that matters.